right, my name is Amberly, and I have the privilege of serving as one of our executive pastors here at Transformation Church. We just wanna say thank you so much for tuning in from wherever you are watching from. And if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. We believe that God has a word for you, so let's jump into this amazing message. Woo! Family, it is so good to be here, but I need you to just remain standing, remain on your feet. I wanna give honor where honor is due. What Pastor Bree didn't tell you is that, yes, I came to play, and I am saved until I step my foot onto a court. But Pastor Bree, in a final hour, beat us because I played with her husband, Aaron, beat us by one point. So I got to honor the woman of God, Pastor Bree, who will be preaching next week. But first and foremost, I want to thank Pastors Mike and Natalie, the entire TC t leadership team, pastoral team, volunteers, for serving so beautifully this community and also around the globe. What an honor and a privilege it is to be here. You can go ahead and grab your seat as we open up the word of God. I know that Pastor Bree had mentioned that, I, that, that I've been here four times and it's crazy to me, it's crazy to me. So when I say family, it's not something that I'm saying just for kicks and giggles. I'm saying family because we are. When I look at you and when I see what God is doing in this space and place, when I get reconnected with familiar people, whether in California where I'm from or, or here, it literally is a testament to God's goodness and his faithfulness. And the reason why I think that we have an inordinate love for each other is because when I look at you, I can see you and salute you. Because we're the type of people who when we fall down, we get back up. In fact, Proverbs says it this way, Proverbs 24, 16 says, though the righteous fall seven times, they get back up eight. This is what I see when I look at this community. And I'm passionate about this because if there's one thing that you know about me, I'm just the girl that won't give up, okay? Uh, a, a quick story that I think could help articulate everything that I learned about me before I knew this about me was my junior year of high school. Junior year of high school, I was captain of the varsity track team, which is a rarity because it's usually for seniors. But I was given this title, I was very excited, and there it is our season invitational opener all the schools from the county were invited this was kind of like you know you got to see each other you got to size each other up who's good who's not who do you got to keep your eye on well as team captain i was very excited that my race and my heat was the very first competition of the entire day uh, there was a, a whole arena that was full of people and uh, i decided that i was called i was anointed to run the 330 hurdles now, thank you for the one person that laughed in the back. Yeah, mm. See, see, what, what a 5'2 Mexican should not do is jump over aluminum things while sprinting. But see, I had a mother who was a woman of God and, and, and drilled into our minds that you could do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And so I said, I could do this. Well, in our league, there was a school that had a pair of sisters, uh, Franisha and Aisha. Sisters, if you know what I'm saying. One was to the right of me in my heat and one was to the left of me in my heat. Undeterred by their stature of, I don't know, five, uh, seven, eight related to Goliath compared to my five, two stature. Undeterred, I get into my starting blocks. The official shoots off the gun and all of us are out of the starting block. We're excited. And I'm actually pacing really well. Hurdle one, poof, cleared. Hurdle two, poof, cleared. I'm feeling real good about myself because I still see that I'm ahead of the pack until all of a sudden, as I am approaching hurdle three, I did the fatal flaw that Coach Julia said never to do. Coach Julia always told all the hurdlers, you never look to the right, never look to the left. You have to run the race ahead of you. But did I listen to Coach Julia? No, because I see a runner come up on me on my wing and I did the thing that you should never do. I took my eyes off of my lane. And what happened was it messed with my speed. It messed with my cadence. It messed with my approach. And the tip of my knee caught the top of the hurdle. I kind of stumbled, but undeterred. 
because I am a conqueror in Christ. Thank you, mother. I made it to hurdle four, but I didn't have the speed, the inertia, and, and the momentum that I needed. And so this time, my entire knee caught the hurdle, and I stumbled and fell to the ground. I had two people pass me, but I said, I'm, I'm still gonna get up and I'm still gonna place in this heat. I know I can make it. So I get up and I approach hurdle five, but I fall over it again. Hurdle six and fall over it again. Hurdle seven, at this point, my knees are bruised, my shins are bloody. Like I'm limping to hurdle eight that I fall over and hurdle nine that I fall over. And by the time that I limp to hurdle 10, I pick up my left leg. I'm straddled the hurdle, I am crying, there's blood everywhere. I pick up my leg and I put it over the hurdle and I limp to the finish line. The auditorium is silent. The arena is quiet, no one is saying anything except this one lone clapper. I, I wanted to cry and just say, please stop, you're making it worse. And you know the most painful and annoying thing for a 17 year old is all the attention on you and all of a sudden I hear an ambulance waiting in the background. They put me on a gurney, a gurney in front of everyone. And they wheel me to the first aid station. I was mortified, I'm the team captain. And out of the corner of my eye, running towards the first aid station, I see Coach Julia. Coach Julia ran up to me. She cut my face in her hands and she said, I am so proud of you. No matter what, you didn't quit. You ran your race. Looking back, thank you for the one lone clapper. That was very kind, very kind. Looking back at that moment, I know that Coach Julia wasn't proud of me because I won, because I did it. The heat behind me like passed me, you know? I was mortified. I wanted the world to open up and swallow me whole, never to be seen again. But the reason why she was proud of me was because I refused to give up. She was proud of me for choosing, because it's a choice, choosing not to quit and showing grit. What is grit? Grit is courage, resolve, and strength of character. If you're the note-taking type, pull out your Bibles, your pens, your highlighters, your notebooks, because the title of our time today is Grit, Don't Quit. Grit, Don't Quit. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 27. We're gonna be camping there, and I'm gonna warn you right now that we do have a good chunk of scripture that we're gonna go through. One thing about me is that I'm a bona fide word nerd, and I'm unashamed to admit it. So I will catch you up on all your Bible reading that you might have skipped this week. But as you turn there in your Bibles, I wanna give a little bit of context. Let me set up the scene. So Paul the apostle, man of God that he is, he's falsely accused and put on trial. But see, what people didn't realize at the time is that they had messed with the wrong man. See, Paul was a Roman citizen. And so when he went to trial, he had the ability to call an audience with the most powerful man in the world, Caesar. So he did. And in order to get an audience with Caesar, he had to board a boat full of prisoners to Rome. And as they are on their way, they are facing a little bit of treacherous waters and Paul decides that he's gonna tell the captain and the crew, listen, captain, I know you're in charge, this is your ship, but I don't think that we should do the rest of this journey. In fact, I think that we are gonna lose cargo and, and, and there's things that, and possibly even lives that we might not lose, I don't think we should go. But the captain didn't listen to him and guess what happened? They are in the middle of a raging sea. And there's a storm that's going on of epic proportion. And we are going to dive into this portion of scripture right here. We're gonna jump into the middle of Paul's storm. And if you're here today and you feel like you were in the middle of a storm, get ready because you're not alone. Look at what the, the writer is giving us privy information to, starting in verse 20. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging. I just have to pause for a second. I'm gonna step away from the word of God because I love the details of the Bible that say that the sun and the stars were gone. You should look at those details and pause and wonder why did they mention that? Because the sun and stars were navigational tools to determine direction. And maybe you came in here today feeling like I've lost my way. I don't know where I'm at. I feel like I'm in the middle of a raging sea. Today, if you are without directions, I believe that we are gonna learn a word from Paul. Look at the rest of verse 20. We finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. 
But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. See, last night an angel of the Lord, uh, of the Lord to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God. It, it will happen. If you brought your Bible, I want you to pause. I want you to highlight your Bible, underline your Bible where it says it will happen. If you didn't bring your Bible, what I want you to do is turn to the neighbor who did bring their Bible and underline it for them. It's called biblical graffiti. I'm about it, okay? Help your neighbor out. It will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Did you keep them? Did you, did you see what happened here? Did you keep pace with what's going on with this biblical novella? In verse 20, we see that the storm kept raging and they were losing hope. Scripture includes the details of the amount of men that were on the boat because that detail is going to come back and matter. But there's over 270 people that are on this boat. And if you feel like you are in the middle of a raging sea, if you feel like you're in the middle of a windstorm and there's no end in sight, you might have felt like you want to toss in the towel, that you want to get off, that you want to quit, that you want to stop. But let me tell you something right now. You might have think that you have lost hope, but the fact that you're here, the fact that you were watching online from around the world or in this building, it shows me that you haven't given up, that there's a shred in your soul that refuses to back down where you are saying, there's more in me. Though the righteous fall seven times, they will get back up. Because your soul knows, your soul, your soul knows that if you are not dead, then God is not done. And you are here today in this venue. You are here today on YouTube. You are listening on the podcast. However, your friend dragged you in from a bet that you lost last night. I don't know how you're here or how you got here. But what I do know is that God has a word for you. Because Paul was dropped into the middle of a storm. And this decision that he made not to quit, not to walk away, but to hold on to faith, determined the destiny of what was ahead. Paul had grit not to quit. Look at verse 24. And uh, the angel said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must. Can somebody say must? must? Stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Oh, what I love is that Paul told the captain, hey, don't sail to Crete. Don't go. Have you ever been in those situations where you find yourself picking up and cleaning up the mistakes of someone else? And you're left to say, why is this going on? What I love is the humanity that we see in Paul. Because Paul holds the humanity of both frustration and faith. I love the pettiness of Paul because he gets real petty here. He's like, I told you. I told you not to do it, and look where we are. We're in the middle of a storm. But as he holds the, frustra the frustration and the faith, as we see here, I want us to have permission to be frustrated, but not to lose faith. Listen to his frustration. In verse 21, he said, if you would have listened to me, this wouldn't have happened. But then he has faith. But because of my God, we will get to our destination. What isn't answered here is the why. Did you catch that? The why is it answered? And for me, this is incredibly hard because I was always the why kid. I was always the why kid. Bianca, clean your room. Why? Bianca, go to church. Why? Bianca, take a shower. Why? I just, I need a legal dissertation as to why I should do something that you are asking me to do. Like, like prove it. And as an adult, if I'm honest with you, I'm still asking some why questions in this season. Why did this have to happen? Why did my friend get cancer? Why did they lose their job and their house and their future? Why did they walk away from the church? All the why questions. Why doesn't my wife love me anymore? Why isn't my child walking with the Lord? See, in difficult moments like that, I love us, church, I do. But sometimes we get real good and fluent at a language called Christianese. You know Christianese? How are you doing? Blessed, highly favored. God is good all the time, and all the time he's good. Yeah, hallelujah. I had my manna in the morning. Praise God. 
We get real good at faking the funk. We get real good at slapping a Bible verse over a bullet wound and pretending that it'll be okay. Jeremiah 29, 11, oh, I know that God has good things for me and plans not for evil. Oh, have you seen Romans 8, 28 on a, on a mug or on a meme on Instagram? God will use all things. He'll bring it together for good. And it's true. But in that moment, I don't want some regurgita regurgitated stuff that you've read in vacation Bible school and you're just trying to dish, ditch me and, and move past and, and not empathize with the pain that I am. Yes, I, I know that God is good, but give me the reason. Better yet, give me the reassurance that this problem will end with a plan and that this pain that I'm currently in, it will have a purpose. Can I be honest with you, church? I, I didn't want to teach this word because I don't feel like the word was ready. But I'm so convicted because this week, I realized that the storm that I'm in, I'm not alone. I know that there's people in here where you find yourself wondering and asking, why? Why? I don't want to hoard. I don't want to spiritually like keep all of this to myself. And so I put aside the, the pretty polished message that I prepared for transformation, the one with the perfectly crafted jokes and the moment where we get to dive into the word of God. And I just want us to be real in the house of God. And so, yes, it's hot girl summer and women are teaching, but I do have a little reservation of getting too emo for the house. So if I get emotional, Sister Jay gave me a little tissue for my issue and we're gonna quickly move on, right? But if Paul, if Paul was here with us today, I think as we will learn through his story is that he will remind us that whatever we're in, no, it has to happen. And when I say those words, or when I speak about the sovereignty of God, what's that? That God's in control of all. We speak about the sovereignty of God. Sometimes we're prone as, as, as Christians to dismiss the pain. And then we're left to ask questions like, wait, are, are you saying that God wanted my husband to have cancer? Are you saying that you wanted my business partner to mismanage funds and now we're pleading bankruptcy? Are you saying that you wanted my loved one to become addicted or for my sister to have cancer? Listen, in a world that is searching for answers that I humbly do not have, what I can bring you is not just biblical history or personal history. What I want to recalibrate your mind and my mind, it is though that we may not know the why, we have to hold on to the who. You may not know the why, but you have got to know the who. Why is that? That rhymes and that's cute. Okay. No, no, no. I need us to understand this because if we stay in the why, we're prone to get bitter. Why did this happen, God? Why did I lose my job? Why did my spouse have an affair? Why am I still sick? Why am I still overweight? Why am I still broken? Because if we stay in the why, we're going to get bitter. But if we focus on the who, who will rescue me when I'm falling? Who will forgive me when I fail? Who will see me when I'm forlorn? Who will be for me when the enemy is against me? When we focus on the who, it is an act of surrender. God, not my will, not my will, it is your will. And I believe, listen to me, listen to me, I believe that in an act of surrender, it is in those moments that we encounter God. Oh, back that up with scripture. I'm so glad that you said that every theologian standing behind YouTube criticizing right now. Look at the next verse. Verse 23 says, Last night, an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I serve. I just got to pause for a second. I know, I know, I know. There's just so much in here. All of these could be separate Bible studies. But I love that Paul gives us a little tidbit, a little mouge bouge for free. He says, the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve. What I believe is that we have a lot of people that say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but they're not serving in a local expression of church. I don't wanna teeter on legalism here. All I'm saying is really easy to say, I go to Transformation Church because I watch one sermon every six weeks. I don't give, I don't tithe, I'm not in a belong group. I belong, but do you serve? Paul the Apostle says, I belong and I serve. This is my clique, my crew, and my God. We roll together. Surrender is saying, not my will, but your will, God. Paul is saying, wait, time out. The angel of the Lord appeared to me, and I belong to him, and I serve him, and he stood beside me. 
Sometimes in moments of crisis, in moments, especially in what feels like storms, these are the moments where we can quietly hear the still voice of a good God. Don't miss the detail of this. In the middle of a storm, an angel appears to Paul with a word. Now, I'm not saying I wore all white to look like an angel, but I do have a word, okay? So I, I hope you appreciate the white suit right now because I believe, I believe, I believe that you may not know the why, but I pray to God you know the who. God, I don't know why this is going on, but I believe, God, that you are good. I don't know why this is happening. Paul is now looking at the men and saying, but an angel came to me. An angel came to me and told me in verse 26, we have to run the ship aground. You ever had those moments? It doesn't make sense, but you know what you have to do? In 2019, uh, prior, to, prior to 2019, I was going into prisons and jails and resourcing the incarcerated, bringing the word of God, so excited about what God was doing in uh, the jails and prisons around the nation. And so when we started the Father's House Orange County, to me, it was like a no-brainer. We got to start a prison campus. And so our first year as a church, we launched our, very, our second campus in a prison. So excited about the testimonies that were coming out, the lives that were being transformed, the salvation that was coming out. I mean, it was a poppin' campus. It was amazing. And then COVID happened. And it was literally overnight where the venue that we had hosted, life change and salvation and worship and invested $75,000 into this campus, was gone. And it wasn't the money for me. It was the fact that we couldn't say goodbye to any of the inmates. We couldn't hug them. We couldn't tell them where we were going. We could tell them nothing. And to me, I was left asking questions. God, did, did we not hear you? How did we get this so wrong? See, that's just one moment of a why, but what's yours? What did you come in here with, with your why? What are you scratching your head over and saying, God, why is this happening? Listen, friend, I don't know your why, but I'm asking you to choose your who. And I'm not trying to brush by this and say, oh, this isn't scary, this is okay. No, no, no. Being in the storm is scary. I'm there. It's terrifying. But what I am saying is to put your faith, your frustrations, and your fear in the hands of a good father who says, I am for you. You may not see it right now, but there's work for you to do. And Paul tells them, listen, y'all, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. But it's not going to be on this boat. It's not going to look the way that you think it's going to look. And during my life right now, the storms that are brewing in my life, I feel like Paul is looking at me in the face saying, hey, B, B, we're going to make it. It's just not going to look the way that you want it to look. I want to be your Paul today, and I want to tell you, you will survive this storm that you're in. You might feel lost. It might be dark. You might have lost your way, but trust me, saint. Trust me, son and daughter of God. God will not leave you alone to be lost at sea. I don't know the why, but I am trusting in the who. There is something in the works. Now, this is me personally. In, in chapter 27, in verses 33 and 34, we're not going to read them, but Paul tells them, okay, we're going to run into the ground, and I know we've all been terrified. We haven't eaten for two weeks, 14 days, scriptures say, so I want to make sure that y'all eat so we survive. And I read this, and I'm like, bless God, Paul is a stress eater, okay? I empathize with him. Yeah. And not only is he a stress eater, he totally co-signs on carbs. Let me prove this, and look at verse 34. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to, the, to God before them all, and broke off a piece and ate it. He's like, yo, have some bread. He says, Jesus says he's the bread of life. I co-sign on these carbs, all right? And you know, some of y'all are really struggling because you've been keto so long. You look like a toothpick and you're like tweaking at the sound of bread, you know? I'm going to tell you, maybe you just need to eat a cheeseburger after church. You know what I'm saying? Don't get a lettuce wrap. A little bread never hurt nobody. It's all I'm saying, just a little. Carbs lead to inflammation, Bianca. I know, Susan, thank you. But sometimes, sometimes we can have a little bit, just, just a little, because Paul's telling them, yo, you need some strength. Paul's telling them it's going to be okay. It will happen. Paul said it will happen, and friends, it did. So I want us to get very bold, very brazen, very comfortable with saying what Paul said. Can somebody please fill this space online in this room, holler back on the treadmill or in your car and say, it will happen. 
I'm going to finish college. It will happen. My marriage is going to stay intact. Somebody shout back, it will happen. My joy will return. Somebody shout back, it will happen. My child is going to come back to faith. Say, it will happen. The church and the assaults that have come up against the church and people trying to destroy the church, guess what? It, nothing will prevail against the, the steady, the solid, the sure-footed church because it will happen. The health that you've been waiting for and begging God for, you keep on this trajectory. Somebody shout back, it will happen. I want us to get real comfortable, family. I want us to get real comfortable with getting bold and brazen with our faith. I'm tired of seeing so many Christians walk around feebly like Eeyore. I don't know what's happening. I'm so sad. Pick your head up right now. It's gonna happen. It's rocky. We're in a storm. We don't know what's going on, but pick yourself up because it's gonna happen. It's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna happen. Look at verse uh, one of chapter 28. Just jump down one verse. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. I'm gonna pause for a second. Let me be a word in her family. For those that love Bible words and geek out with me, my mentor's like, Bianca, people don't like details the way you do. You're gonna love them today, okay? Because whoever thinks that God doesn't have jokes, it's hilarious. The Bible is full of irony and I love it because the name of the island was called what? Malta. The name Malta means refuge. I need every saint, every godmother, every church mother to start waving a hanky right now and praising the Lord. Because if you're in the middle of a storm, I declare, I prophesy, I believe that there is a Malta waiting for you. That there is a refuge that God has. It doesn't make sense. You can't see it. It looks like you're gonna crash and burn, but I'm gonna testify that there is a Malta waiting for you. There is a refuge waiting for you. What is refuge? It is a shelter, a condition of being safe of danger. So I know not all of us have great vivid imaginations. I read my Bible like a biblical novella. So I know I have to bring that to you right now on the screen is a picture of Malta. On the screen, this is actual Malta. I mean, that looks like a vacation spot to me, okay? Like, well, Paul, are you crying right now? Like, this is amazing. But I found this picture of this boat to give us a visual that quite possibly something like this of a boat was crashing in to these rocks. They had to run into the ground. There's debris, there's wood pieces, there's planks. People are doggy paddling to the shore because there is a refuge. There is a refuge. The Lord is my refuge and strength. Do you need a refuge today? There's a Malta coming. There's a storm, but you're gonna make it. Look at verse two. The Islanders showed us unusual kindness. Okay, really quick, because Islanders is another funny thing. See, see, the word in Greek is actually barbarians. NIV translation, they're real nice. The Islanders, it's barbarians, why? Because the Greek people thought that anyone who didn't speak Greek, that their language sounded like bar, 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 bar. So they're barbarians. So the barbarians showed them unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. So Malta is an unfamiliar place with an unfamiliar language. Have you been there? Shipwrecked, salty, doggy paddling to a place of safety, of sure-footed standing to some random place where it feels like you don't speak the language. Grit don't quit, babe. This is Malta. Have you been to Malta? Now, Malta is a small island off the Greek islands in Europe. It's beautiful, it's stunning. Uh, if you want more biblical details, there's a map in the back of your Bible where you could see Paul's missionary journeys. But, but I'm talking about Malta. I'm talking about a place that Paul was never supposed to go. See, we know the details in chapter 27. Paul was going to Rome, but now he finds himself on itty bitty little Malta. Have you ever found your play, your, yourself in a place that you don't know how you ended up here? This is not where I was supposed to be. This is not what I was expecting. See, Paul was going to Rome, the most powerful place in the world, to speak to the most powerful man in the world, Caesar. And yet he finds himself on this island. That he finds himself on a place that he can't even imagine and most definitely cannot locate on a map. 
What about you? Have you been to Malta? Malta is the divorce that you didn't see coming. Malta is the sickness that your doctor just diagnosed you with. Malta is the relationship issues that have swung a right hook and took you by surprise. Malta is the rehab center that you are paying for your loved one because of addiction that is running rampant in your family. Malta is the bankruptcy that you tried your hardest to avoid and yet find yourself here. So I ask you again, family, online and in this room with a show of hands, have you ever been to Malta? Keep your hands up, because if you're not on Malta right now, have you ever been to Malta? That's a good amount of us. Go ahead and put your hands down. Online family, that's for you. You put it in the chat box. Have you been to Malta? Because I'm here to remind you that though Malta may be where you are, Malta is not where you live. Malta is not where you live. Great, don't quit. Great, don't quit. Let's carry on. Look, look. Verse 3, Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself onto his hands. Okay, this is the part of the story where I'm like, uh-uh, bro. This ain't happening. This is too much. Like, are you for real right now? See, in Yiddish, there's a Yiddish proverb where you kind of like acquiesce and you throw your shoulders up and you say, meh, it could be worse. This is worse, okay? This is as worse as it goes. The snake is hanging off of Paul's wrist. And in my mind, it's, it's, its fangs are clutched to his wrist. And I don't want to interpret the text incorrectly. So I'm going to step away from the Bible for a second as I give you this tidbit of information for funsies and for freezies. See, I, I believe, I believe that as I was preparing for the message and picturing this, this viper, this snake on the wrist of Paul, seeing it dangling, that there's always going to be people that are going to attach themselves to you and give you the reason for your why. See, we're going to explain this in a second. We're going to explain this in, in, in a second. But you're going to have people in your life that are going to have an opinion. Well, if she didn't take that job, well, if he didn't go there, well, if they didn't move there, no. People love to assign a why, but they're not the who. Nope. People will assign the why, but they're not the who. So you tell Hater Jose and Salty Sal and Bitter Betty, nope, you are not the Lord. You are not the who. You cannot assign my who. There's going to be people that are going to try to do this. Bear note, look at verse four. When the islanders saw that the snake, saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer. For though he escaped from the sea, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. There must be something wrong with him. He's done something wrong. Look at the gods are after him. And I love the next verse because Paul preaches one of the most powerful messages that I see in the scope of scripture. And he doesn't say a word. Look at verse five. But Paul, but Paul, but Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. Paul didn't try to convince the haters, the doubters, and the skeptics. No, Paul learned what well, we have to. When you make it through the storm, when you make it through the shipwreck, when all hell breaks loose on shore, and then you get bit, let me tell you what to do. You shake it off. You shake it off. Nope, nope, nope. Paul had faith. This has to happen. I've got Rome to get to. This has to happen. No, 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 no. I've got to meet with Caesar. No, 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 no. This has to happen. The gospel has to go forth. Grit, don't quit. So shake off the biters, shake off the haters, and shake off the snakes, because we all know they exist. Don't reply to them on social media. Don't give them a comment. Don't give them room, because what's happening is these people are looking at you, and they're assigning your why, and they're looking at you to shrivel up and die. Oh, just wait. They're going to be gone in no time. Paul knew he was not going to die on Malta. Paul wasn't going to make a scene because there was a plan in place for him. He wasn't going to die in Malta because Rome was waiting. It has to happen. This has to happen. I will make it. And some people right now in life, you're wasting so much time trying to figure out the who and the why. But it's the wrong who and the wrong why. You don't know the why. Focus on the who. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. In a moment of being hot, humble, open, and transparent, this has been the hardest season of my entire life. 
And I have asked God so many why questions. I have every reason to quit. I have every reason to walk away. It's not your business, but God knows. And I have to be like Paul and say, if he didn't quit, I can't either. And if you came in here today, I'm here to tell you, we know what quitting feels like. I want you to know what not quitting feels like because quitters never win and winners never quit, okay? So I'm not gonna quit. And I don't care if you can barely move yourself, I will drag you. People on social media are like, oh, they're trying to drag me. No, I literally will drag you, okay? We're gonna drag you onto the shores of Malta. There's a refuge. You might be on Malta, but that's not where you're gonna live. So after Paul shakes off this snake, check out what happens in verse six. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and they said, he must be a God. Did anyone stop and help him? No, no, they were waiting for him to shrill up and die. And people are looking at you to do the same thing. People see you bitten, people see you shipwrecked, and nobody pays attention. They're looking at you and assigning the why, but they ain't the who, okay? No, 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 no. See, we have a thief, we have an enemy, we have a, 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 an attacker against us who's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm here to tell you that in moments where you feel bitten, where you feel shipwrecked, when you feel abused, when you feel forlorn, when you feel forgotten, you can shout back to the enemy and the haters, I still have my joy. I still have my hope. I am on Malta and the thing that was supposed to take me out didn't. I'm still here. I'm still here. Because there will be people that will assign the why. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they come back, and once you survive, they're like, I knew it all along. I knew it all along. They're looking at you saying, oh, they're not going to make it. They're going to be buried six feet under. No one's going to help them. And then they stand at your college graduation and say, I knew they had it in them the entire time. Absolutely. People are critiquing you and judging you as a teen single mom saying, oh, that's because of your mistakes. See, if you would have been a youth group, you would have keep your legs crossed. None of this would have happened. But then they're cheering for you and celebrating how God has used you in the lives of so many others. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. Today's word isn't about seeing the grit that Paul had. It's about knowing how we can develop grit because there's people in this room that are on Malta. The question I'm asking is, do you know what to do when you're in Malta? The truth is Paul didn't have a plan. Paul didn't want to go to Malta. Paul had no desire to go to Malta, and yet there he is. So let's hold on to get some practical handles on what to do in those moments of waiting. Look at verse 7. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us into his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. So Paul is this local hero who gets bit by a snake and survives. And then he's invited to a bougie house to be with people of influence. So what if our adversity is the thing that opens up doors for places that we would have never had access to? What, what if our adversity actually makes room for your opportunity? Where Paul can say, I had to go through the storm. I had to go through the shipwreck. I had to doggy paddle to the island shore. I had to get bitten by the snake because God is gonna do something here that I cannot see. So Paul is there for a couple days and then he meets Publius's father. Look at verse eight. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Now at this time, fever and dysentery, this is a death sentence, but something's about to change. There's a purpose in the plan. While Paul is in Publius's house, he discovered that there is another man there that needed a miracle. We're about to watch a Malta miracle, okay, okay? Now we're stepping on the gas pedal. Now in my culture, we're gonna say, dale gas, we're gonna go. I don't talk fast, you listen slow. Look at verse eight. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer, after prayer, after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. Paul could have gotten bitten and bitter, but he didn't. He maximized every opportunity to be used by God. And in the moments when you feel like you wanna quit, you wanna run away, you wanna hide, you wanna go to the dark night of soul, I'm gonna ask you to do this. Stay and serve, stay and serve. What happens because of Paul's commitment not to quit? There's a miracle in Malta. Look at verse nine again. 
When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. At what point did Paul realize that there was ministry on Malta to take place? At what point did Paul awaken to the idea that there was something that God wanted to do? Because if you're here and you still don't believe me that there's a point in all of this, and you're listening to me with skepticism and doubt, maybe you're hurt and bitter, I just want to highlight one detail. One detail I don't want you to lose. Look at verse 8. Paul went in to see him, and after prayer, placed his what? Oh, no, 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 no. We got to say it like we can read. He placed his what? Hands on him and healed him. This is the second thing that I want us to hold on to, to build grit and resilience in our own life. Find purpose in the pain. Bear with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Someone's going to hear this and have a hard time digesting this. Please hear me say, your trauma is not good. Your pain is not good. I'm not trying to learn a lesson in the loss. No, no, no. What I am saying is that in the pain, we have a choice on our perspective. This darkness of a mine, I will find a diamond. This dark night of soul, I believe, God, that you're going to give me a glimmer of hope. Because Paul was sentenced to Rome as a prisoner. He went through a storm. He was shipwrecked. He was shivering on a shore. He lit a fire and got bit by a snake just a couple days earlier. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you came in here with. I don't know what Malta you were hanging on out on. I don't know what snake that you walked in here dangling off of your wrist. But you better start praising God. You want to know why? Because what you went through did not kill you. What you went through did not kill you. And what you went through will give others confidence in who when they cannot see the why. What storm have you made it out of? What shipwreck did you survive? What snake bite did you live up against and shore that you got washed up on? What did you survive that you wish you wouldn't have? I'm here to tell you there's a reason for Malta. And this is the third thing I want you to hold on to is you're building grit. Use your hands to heal. See, Scripture says that he placed his hands on the dad. His hands, his hands, his hands. This is interesting. This is interesting because the same hand that was bitten was the same hand that was used to heal. In your hands, God wants to do some healing from your place of pain. Listen to me. God is birthing purpose in you. Please don't give up. Don't stop pushing in the middle of laboring and believing for what God has called you to. Because look at verse 9 again. As we wrap up this, when this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. So after he After he laid his hands on this man's head, word got around to the whole island. And now all of a sudden, this house became a church. And it wasn't just one miracle. It was miracle upon miracle upon the miraculous. I may not know the why, but I am looking and believing at the who. That God is good. That God does good. That God is going to work this out for good even on your Malta. Even on my Malta. This is why we can't quit in the storm. Because there's healing on the shore. It has to happen. I may not like it. I may not want it. I may not agree with it. I may not want to see it. I may not want to survive it. But it has to happen. Because you don't know what you're continuing to push on will demonstrate to others. And what doors of opportunity, salvation, and freedom will come through. Remember the prison campus that was closed in 2020? It was gutting and it was devastating and I felt foolish. I felt like I have squandered God's people's money. I felt like a fraud. I felt like a heretic. It's not that big of a deal. It's just one campus, life goes on. But an interesting call came a a couple months ago when we had an opportunity to go back to that campus and start again. But it's even better because what we didn't see then but we now see now is that it has now created an opportunity not for us to get into one prison Not two prisons, but three prisons for both men and women. I didn't know the why. 
Why, God? I don't know the why, but I'm choosing to declare a perspective that you are good. I'm choosing to declare that this pain will birth something new in me that will bring freedom to others, that you are not done with me, that the hands that have been bitten will be the very hands that you use to heal. I don't have to be ashamed of what I'm going through, my pain, my loss, my insecurity or embarrassment. I know that my God has gone before me and I am choosing to believe there is Rome that is waiting. And there's not just a Rome that is waiting for me. There's a Rome that is waiting for you. Maybe you're here today and maybe you don't feel like Paul. Maybe you feel more like the captain of the ship who didn't listen. You were told to go left and you went right. I'm going to bring the band up here because we're about to worship in a second. But, but in those moments, in those moments where you're realizing that your decisions have cost you to be in a storm, where you were in a windstorm and you were being tossed to and fro, Maybe you feel like you were in a storm that you've caused. Or maybe you feel like you were in a whirlwind. Maybe you feel like you are picking up the pieces of the mistakes of other people. You're, you're cleaning up the mistakes of something that you didn't cause. You feel tossed and lost. You haven't eaten, you're scared in the moments of darkness. You feel like you have lost your way. I'm telling you, there's a man in the boat who won't let you drown. He won't. You might lose all your stuff. Your survival may not look like what you expected, but you will have your life, your realist life. Like my mentor told me, the grit that don't quit is the grace you can't waste. I know you're tired. I know you're angry. I know you're frustrated. I know you're sad. I resonate with you. I even validate that pain but I love you too much to let you stay there. I'm asking by the mercies of God that you don't get, give up, that you might have been knocked down because the righteous will fall seven, but they will get back up eight. You can fall down, but you gotta get back up. You could be shipwrecked, but you gotta stand your ground. You could be bitten, but I don't want you to get bitter. Why? Because God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you and he's not done. God has a plan for you, he's not done and he doesn't want you to do it alone. The words of Jesus say, come to me all who are heavy laden and burdened and I will give you rest. I will give you rest for your weary souls. I'm gonna pray two prayers in this room and online for our online family. If you're here today, your soul is weary. You've been asking why God, why God, why God? I want us to focus on the who. If you feel like you have been knocked down, you feel like you've been living in the middle of a storm, you feel like what has been tossed at you and thrown at you and hurled at you from insults to accusations, I'm gonna ask you right now to make a decision. I may not know the why, but I'm choosing to trust in God. If that is you, I'd love to pray for you. This is not a salvation invitation. This is an admonition, an admission saying, ah, I need Jesus to be my strength because I'm in the middle of a storm and I cannot quit, but I feel like quitting. If that is you, will you raise your hand? There's hands going up all over on our global online campus. Put a hand emoji in the chat box, put your name, put your issue, whatever it is. But we have people that wanna pray with you in this room and around the world, but as hands are going up, if you are seated next to somebody who has their hand up and you are not in a season where you're in a storm, will you do me a favor? Would you put your hand on their shoulder? Don't be creepy. Leave it right here, right on the shoulder. Yes. We begin to intercede as we create, a, create space for the Spirit of God to do in our lives of the, of the brothers and sisters who need a multi-miracle right now. Spirit of living God, we invite you into this space and I, I humbly come before you and I pray for every single person in this room and watching online who needs a touch from you, who is tired, who feels like they don't wanna go on. Will you meet them right where they are, Lord? I pray for a supernatural indwelling of your Holy Spirit to give them joy and hope and strength and love that they didn't know that they needed or they think that they could possess. In Jesus' name, amen. For those that have been watching online and you feel like 
man, I haven't been walking with the Lord. I don't know how I stumbled upon this message. My friend sent it to me, shared a YouTube link, sent me the podcast, and now I'm listening to this. And, and I realized that I want Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. We're gonna do what we do every single week here at TC, TC and give an invitation for salvation. For those that have never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm gonna invite you very boldly and brazenly in this room and online. If you are saying, yes, I need Jesus to be the captain of my ship. I've been running this aground for far too long. If you've never said yes to Jesus, or maybe at one point you have, but you have since turned and walked away from the Lord, let me remind you today that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can come back and say yes to Jesus. I'm gonna count to three. When I count to three, you're gonna boldly raise your hand. But in this moment, here in this room and online, will you do me a favor? Will you bow your head? Will you close your eyes? to create a sacred space for those making this decision. If you're here today, you've never said yes to Jesus online and in this building. One, by raising your hand, you are saying, I want Jesus to be the personal Lord and Savior of my life. Two, by raising your hand, you are saying that my mistakes and my failures, what the Bible refers to as sin, could be forgiven. And three, the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave will live in me. If that is you, one, two, three. Will you raise your hand? I believe that there's hands. God bless you, yes. God bless you, God bless you. I believe that there's hands online. Go ahead and put a hand emoji in the chat box. You're saying yes to Jesus. Family, to, to let those, uh, there's another hand over there. There's more hands going up. God bless you. Listen, for those that have raised their hands, God bless you, to say yes to Jesus, we're gonna let our family know that they're not alone in this decision. That in saying yes to Jesus, they've stepped into a spiritual family. So church, will you repeat after me? Will you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I choose you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you lived, you died, and you rose again just for me. Fill me with your spirit to do the things that I cannot do. Transform my mind with your power. I give you my life in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Can we celebrate? Can we celebrate those in this room and around the world that have said yes to Jesus? Now here's the thing. If you said yes to Jesus, we don't want you to be alone in this. We want you to text SAVED, S-A-V-E-D, to 828282. We got a Bible for you. We got some resources for you. But you know what we're gonna do right now? Some of y'all have to go, I know. But some of us need to have a little praise party. Some of us need to stand to our feet and declare that God has never let us down. He has been faithful in every season. So if you have some time online and in this room, do not walk out without putting a praise on the promises of God. He's good, He's worthy, and He's mighty of praise. So church, can we raise our hands? Can we raise our voice? And can we sing a song of worship? Yes. Come on, come on. Let's not be shy. We're going to have a praise party. Thank you so much for watching this message. We pray that it encouraged you. Our vision is to represent God to the lost and found for transformation in Christ. And if you would like to partner with us in giving, you can text GIVE to 828282 or visit us on our website. Also, be sure to like, subscribe, and check out our other sermons as well. Our service begins every Sunday at 1045 a.m. Central Standard Time. Now go out and live a transformed life.